I'm uh, Bishop Sandra Steiner Ball, and I want to take a couple of minutes to uh, give you a summary of the One Church Plan. But before I speak about that summary, let me just remind you that uh, when we reach the general conference, the special general conference, actually any general conference, bishops do not have vote. And so it is the delegations who uh, discern and pray together and work together uh, to make decisions um, for the United Methodist Church. I just wanted to remind us of that up front. Um, I also want to remind you that as the commission did its work, um, it was steeped in prayer and it was also steeped in biblical study. As a matter of fact, um, as the commission came together, they took a great deal of time uh, studying the letter to the Galatians. Um, we were working at that point on just what unity um, in a biblical sense is all about and, and also uh, this gift of diversity that is also our gift from God. And as you look through the report and as you've heard updates, there was not just the letter to the Galatians, but there was also uh, the passage from John about the vine and the branches and, and a whole host of biblical texts as we worship together, as we shared testimony and witness, um, and all that is foundational to each one of our plans. So the One Church Plan. The One Church Plan uh, fits our vision, mission, and scope. Uh, it maintains the unity of the church um, in that it, it maintains the structure as we are familiar with it uh, today. It keeps the, the general um, teams, boards, and agencies. It keeps our, our annual conference structure, our jurisdictional structure, our general conference structure all in place. So what does the One Church Plan do? Well, uh, the One Church Plan deals with our conversation around human sexuality by looking at the Book of Discipline and realizing that the, the language around the practice of homosexuality being incompatible with Christian teaching was phrasing that was introduced in 1972. Um, to the Book of Discipline, and subsequently from that point there were also added um, some prohibitions around same-gender marriage and some prohibitions around ordained, uh, ordaining um, self-avowed practicing homosexuals. So in the One Church Plan, um, that plan removes that restrictive language. It doesn't replace it with any kind of pro or con language, but it removes that language. Uh, the One Church Plan uh, then gives permission um, to our churches uh, to examine the context in which they find themselves and to be able to have uh, the, the religious freedom um, to discern what is helpful in fulfilling their mission of reaching all people for Christ. So in the One Church Plan, there will be a language um, that is included that says, um, we will not, um, we will not uh, force anybody to do same gender marriages. Um, there will not be, clergy will not have to do same gender marriages, uh, churches will not have to host same gender uh, weddings. In fact, the, the discipline currently gives clergy the authority uh, to determine who they will or will not marry. They don't have to marry every single person who asks them to officiate a, a wedding. Um, and congregations already have the authority to set policy for how their buildings are used. So the One Church Plan gives um, the, the freedom for people to remain true to their theological convictions and stances. 
So if you're a very traditional person in a very traditional church, in the one church plan, you will not be asked to change your convictions or the way that you interpret the biblical text. Um, you are, uh, your stance is respected and valued. And in, in that context, um, being true to your convictions enables you to be the best mission and witness for the sake of Christ in this world. In the same way, if you are a more progressive person, um, your stance is also respected. And in, if you are in a more progressive context, um, the One Church Plan gives you the freedom to reach all the people within your context with the saving knowledge and love of Jesus Christ so that God's work of transformation might be done in others as well as us. Because in reality, the only being who knows truly what needs to be transformed in God is God. And uh, in the One Church Plan, we trust God to transform whatever needs to be transformed in me as well as whatever needs to be transformed in, uh, another, in, in another person. So the One Church Plan gives us the ability to go out and fulfill our responsibility for reaching all people for Christ, uh, trusting that God will be, bring the transformation that is needed in each and every person. The um, One Church Plan um, does not require any votes. Um, for clergy, for congregations, for annual conferences, uh, for jurisdictional conferences. The One Church Plan also continues to allow um, the central conferences to adapt um, portions of the discipline uh, it, it, to uh, meet their particular contextual needs. That's how it, it, it works now and, and that will not change under the One Church Plan. Um, the One Church Plan keeps all of our, our general church teams, boards, and agencies, our theological schools uh, in place, and, and, and our other United, uh, United Methodist-related institutions in place. Um, so that is, uh, that's a little bit of a summary of the One Church Plan. The one question that um, I've gotten on the One Church Plan is, is um, uh, how does this affect appointments? Um, because in the One Church Plan, uh, again, the, the uh, ability for the Board of Ordained Ministry to make determinations around um, people, candidates who are ready for ministry, the One Church Plan keeps that, um, that responsibility with the Board of Ordained Ministry. And again, in the context of an annual conference, um, the, the prohibition against ordaining a self-avowed practicing homosexual is removed. But again, we don't have to. Um, a, a Board of Ordained Ministry does not have to um, ordain any person. So the One Church Plan really leaves the, the process of evaluation um, in terms of readiness for ordination in the hands of the, the boards of ordained ministry and then the clergy session of the annual conference because of course in our process, in our system, the clergy session has to affirm uh, the board of ordained ministry's discernment. So what happens um, in the appointment process if uh, a clergy person um, is of a different theological stance than um, than some of our, our congregations in our annual conference. Let me just say, uh, bishops deal with that question all the time. Um, and the appointment process continues to have a missional focus, which means bishops and cabinets look at the theological stances and, and the way that congregations interpret the biblical text and the mission of, 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 the, of that congregation, and they prayerfully discern a clergy person who can come in and, and fits 
that theological stance and, and that missional movement of that congregation um, so that both can work together to fulfill in the best way possible the mission of Christ in their particular context. That will not change. It does not and will not serve the purpose for which the church exists uh, to place a clergy person um, in, a, an, in a congregational context with, where they interpret the Bible differently or have a very disparate um, a theological stances. So the appointment process will continue as it has always done. We look for the best missional matches for clergy and congregation so that God's will can be fulfilled.